the time that we have here on the earth, the physical time, and even Einstein has proven this in his theory of relativity, that our time is different than the time in the space and the time beyond space, which is the spiritual realm, the realm of God, the realm of spirits. So what we consider here as one day, like the scripture says, one day before God is like a thousand years and thousand years like one day. So time and the, the, the understanding of time is different here on earth than in the spiritual. One time I was in prayer and I was in prayer on my knees for four hours. When I came out of my, I was in the spirit. When I came out of the spirit, I felt like I was in prayer for 10 minutes or 15 or half an hour. My knees were numb. I was in the spirit and I recognized time was different. I thought I was talking to God for like half an hour or 15 minutes, but in reality it was four hours I was in the spirit. That's when God revealed to me about the Najat television a broadcast that would bring millions of Muslims to God. And so when we say three days of Jesus being in Hades, three days of our time, but in the spiritual realm, you know, have you ever uh, experienced pain, extreme pain, excrucial pain, where you just, you lose sense of time. Like if you were in pain for five minutes, you feel like your entire body's exhausted and you've been in pain for, for days. So Jesus, in the spirit realm, in Hades, the world, the world of spirits, where the spirits are kept, is feeling this agony and pain and now being in Tartarus, being tortured by all these demons. Because we're going to read that again. I'm saying all of this based on the scripture. So he's abandoned there by the Father, by the Holy Spirit, no help whatsoever. His, his man, his spirit is a man's spirit. His soul is a man's soul. Jesus became 100% human being. And that man, that spirit, that soul is being tortured and torment, paying the penalty, agony of pangs of death. Uh, again, that translation was like pangs of birth. Have you ever seen a mother being in pain constantly? The pain comes and goes, comes and goes, comes and goes. My wife, when uh, she gave birth to our daughter, our first kid, Kelly, she was in pain, I think, for 15 hours. She was going in and out of that, that pangs of birth. That's what the scripture says. This is a compare it. So in those three days, only the Father knows, and Jesus, how much pain he suffered out there. I, I cannot imagine. But it's quite a bit. And this psalm, Psalm 88, it's kind of, give us bits and pieces of it. He says, abandoned, verse 5, among the dead, like the slain who lie in the grave, whom you no longer remember. Now he's talking about separation there. And they are cut off from your hand. God is not helping him down there. You have put me in the lowest pit, Tartarus, in dark places, in the depths. Your wrath has rested upon me. Again, this couldn't be about David because the Bible says David died and went to be with his fathers. Means in paradise before the bosom of Abraham. So this is not about David. This psalm is about Jesus. Your wrath has rested upon me. The wrath of God came on him, as Isaiah says in chapter 53. God's wrath was on Do we understand that? That God was wrathful against his eternal son on our behalf. That, I, don't, I don't understand that. Do you? I mean, it, my mind tried to grasp this, that does God love me so much that he kept beating on Jesus? That's what, that's what Isaiah 53 says. He says, you smashed my soul. 
You broke my soul into pieces because of the sins of many. God beating, his wrath is coming on Jesus in that grave, in that Hades, down there in Tartarus. All these demons surrounding him. He's being in torture and agony. He even loses his memory about this. Notice, he says, you afflicted me with all your waves, waves of wrath. You have removed my acquaintances far from me. You have made me an object of loathing to them. I am shut up and cannot go out. He was in complete shackles and chains down there. My eye grows dim from misery. I have called upon you every day, Lord. I have spread out my hands to you. Will you perform wonders for the dead? Or will the departed spirit rise and praise you? Will your graciousness be declared in the grave? Your faithfulness in the Abaddon? Will your wonders be made known in the darkness and your righteousness in the land of forgetfulness? I'm telling you, Jesus is, his human spirit and soul is, is losing, because of pain, loses memory. Losing memories. Again, uh, I, I want you to meditate on this psalm to see the price that God paid for our sins. He says, and in the morning my prayer comes before you. Lord, why do you reject my soul? Why do you hide your face from me? I was miserable and about to die from my youth on. I suffered your terrors. I grow weary. Your burning anger has passed over me. Your terrors have destroyed me. They have surrounded me like water all day long. They have encircled me all together. You have removed lover and friend far from me, my acquaintances, are in a hiding place. That's the price Jesus, the Son of God, paid for our sins. And again, now, on the exactly when, most likely someday on the third day, God, when he released all that wrath that he had against all mankind, from Adam onward to the end of this earth, all of that wrath came out of God on Jesus. And you know when, when you're angry at something, when somebody has done you wrong and, you know, committed a, a crime and the, the law grabs that person and they take him to justice and they pay temp penalty for their crime, somehow your soul is rested. You can see the, the people that, the family members were murdered at the hand of Hamas. When Israelis took to Hamas and made them to pay for their penalties, you, those people feel a release that justice has been served. And this is exactly what happened to the Father. When Jesus paid the penalty for our sins, down there, and the waves of God's wrath came on him, and he was tormented there, Pangs of death on him. Then, when God released all that anger that he had towards us, then God's demand of justice was served. And God was satisfied with the sacrifice of Jesus. And when God was satisfied, now we understand. Let's go back to 1 Peter. Now we understand what it says. He suffered for sins. In verse 18, having been put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. Now, you know, I've read many people's interpretation of this scripture. And the Lord forgive me. They all out of sync. Because, again, why would Jesus' spirit be made alive? Wasn't he alive? Was his spirit dead? How could he be made alive? If he's made alive, it means he was dead, right? Made alive means that he was dead. Now he's made alive. He's talking about Jesus' position with the Father. Again, going back to that spiritual death. It means separation from the Father. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Made alive means relationship was restored. How? By God making Jesus righteous again. 
or justify the spirit of Jesus. I'm, we're talking about the human spirit. The human spirit that became sin. Jesus became justified in his spirit when God was satisfied with the demand of justice, when the penalty was paid, when Jesus paid the penalty with pangs of death. And that's now, now we understand 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. It says, without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifested in the flesh, justified in the spirit. Why would he be justified in the spirit? Wasn't he justified? Wasn't he sinless? Why would he be justified? Why? Because 2 Corinthians 5, 21, he who knew no sin, God made him to be sin. He was separated from the Father. He became darkness. He became sin. He became that serpent. He became separated from the Father. And when he paid the penalty, and when God was satisfied with that penalty, when God's anger came out wave after wave on him, and God was emptied himself of his wrath against sin and man's rejection of him, then God said, okay, that's enough, son. You are now justified. God justified Jesus in his spirit. As a matter of fact, Jesus is the first born-again man, talking about human being, first born-again man over all creation. We're going to look at that verse as well. And now we understand Acts chapter 13. Here's another verse that so many people have gone off with crazy stuff out of this. As a matter of fact, that Arianism that I think began in the 3rd century has caused, or was it later, caused so much trouble Jehovah's Witnesses and Mormonism and so many other sects, false teaching that came out of that because of this verse. Verse 33 says, God has fulfilled this for us, the children, in that he has raised up Jesus and is also written in the second Psalm, you are my son, today I have begotten you. And you know, they interpret that Jesus was a created being. How could it be a created being when it says in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. In the beginning, the Word was with God. So he is an eternal God forever, from beginning to the end. He was not created. He, he was with the Father from the beginning. What beginning? Again, when we say beginning is our time. God doesn't have any time according to our understanding of beginning of something and end of something. And so they interpret that scripture, today I have begotten you. But this is talking about today in that down there in Hades when God restored that relationship with Jesus and Jesus became born again. And that day he restored his relationship that he had from the beginning. Today I have begotten. Today, you're the firstborn. And that's what it says in, uh, let's go back to Colossians. And he says in verse 15, Colossians chapter 1, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. Now, again, that scripture has also caused a lot of controversies. Uh, people take that as though Jesus was created. But no, it's talking about firstborn of all creation, meaning down there, he was the firstborn human being. Remember, Jesus went on the cross as a human being, not as the Son of God, but as the human being. He became man. If he was the Son of God, or I mean, if he, if he had appeared as the Son of God, he was the Son of God. If he appeared as the Son of God, he couldn't sacrifice for us. You know, John used to put his head on his, on his lap. Uh, prostitutes would come and wash his feet the very person who used to be so close to Jesus, Revelation chapter 1 sees him as he is, as the Son of God, with his glory. And he says, I couldn't understand it. I fell down on my face like a dead man. Nobody could approach him, much less they crucify him. His glory, the eminent of the light shining out of him, would blind every human being. They, they couldn't stand in his presence. No human being can stand in the presence of God and live. So God said to Moses. And so, but he was, he was a human being he, as, as an Adam. That's why the Bible calls it second Adam. As a man, he died. As a man, he went to Hades, his soul and spirit. 
a human soul and a human spirit went down there and paid the penalty. And so a human soul and a human spirit became born again down there. Are you understanding the scripture now? That's why it says the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. What does that mean? The firstborn again man. The first one who became justified. Of all the human history, all the way from Adam to Jesus, he was the first one in Hades become born again and be able to be justified. The rest of them couldn't because Jesus hasn't been resurrected yet. This is beautiful. <laughs> you know, I explain all of this in my book, uh, Redemption. So now you understand. Again, let's go back to 1 Peter. Let's go back to 1 Peter, the verse we started with. Now we understand all of this. For Christ also suffered for sins once for all time, the just for the unjust, so that he might bring us to God, having been put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. Now you understand what that means, made alive in the spirit. Which he also went and made proclamation. Now here's another verse that a lot of people have problem with. To the spirits in prison. Again, who are these spirits? Some say, oh, these are all demon spirits. No, verse 20 tells you what they are. Who once were disobedient. What is he talking about? Human being. When the patience of God kept waiting in the days of Noah, during the construction of the ark, in which a few, that is eight persons, were saved. He's talking about those, those human beings there. Uh, during the time that Noah preached, there were possibly millions and upon millions of people on the earth. It took Noah, Noah was 500 years when God commanded him to build the ark, and he was 600 when the, when the flood came. So it took Noah 100 years to build that ark. Interesting, Noah built his ark in a place where there was no lake, no ocean, no water, and no rain had ever come down to the earth in the time before the flood, because there was a canopy covering the earth that, 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 Watered the earth. And so there was no need for rain. There were possibly no clouds in that time. So the idea of a flood coming and overpowering the entire earth was a mocking thing for an unbelieving heart. So millions of people would come by every day and mock that man. Yet he preached Christ and the salvation of God. And so he's talking about in that time that he went down there, Jesus, after his justification. Uh, there's something that I want to mention here before we talk about this, that when Jesus became justified, several things he did down there before he come up. Uh, one was proclamation to all those spirits of those people during Noah's time. Now, that, that word proclamation, let me explain this before we go on, is the word caruso. So that word that we, we see here, that word proclamation is the word caruso, which means proclaiming victory, announced as a herald to proclaim victory. In the ancient times, a herald would proceed generals and kings in the celebration of military victories, announcing to all the victories won in battle. Peter did not use the word euchelisonai. Now, let me see if I can write this. Eu, make sure I'm getting all the word in here so you can look it up. Eu, a, chelisomai, which means to evangelize. So this idea that Jesus went down there and evangelized to those dead people, spirit, there's no such thing. We have no second chance. Once it is appointed for men to die and once or to live and to die and then after that judgment. There is no such thing as a second chance. There's no purgatory. Uh, don't go and purchase no purgatory from churches. <laughs> Catholic Church used to do that. None of that stuff. So Jesus did not go in there, evangelize to those, those people. Noah did it for 100 years, and they did not listen to him. And they rejected and mocked God and mocked the idea of salvation through one man, Jesus. And so they're in Hades. They're still in Hades. But Jesus there showed them, listen, all you mockers, 
This is what Noah talked about. Proclaim his victory. And not only did Jesus do that, but Jesus also did something else. And we can see this in, uh, let's go back to the scripture. In Colossians chapter uh, 2 and in verse uh, 15. When he had disarmed the rulers and authorities, he made a public display of them, having triumphed over them through him. Now, if you look at the Weymouth translation, Weymouth makes more clear. It says, and the hostile princes and rulers, he shook up from himself and boldly displayed them as his conquest when by the cross he triumphed over them. Now, so this is what happened. After he met the demand of justice and God was satisfied and God declared him justified in the spirit, he became righteous again. His relationship was stored from a lamb going down there as a lamb. He became a lion all of a sudden. And all those spirits being in Tartarus that were on him. And I had a dream about once about this. It's hard to explain it. But it was like seaweed around his body. It was wrapped around me in a dark pit. And I felt like tortured all the time. You know, it's, it's such a matter. That all those spirits on him. The wrath of God, wave of God coming upon him. And now all of a sudden God is satisfied. The demand of justice is met. The, the, the penalty for sins paid for. God declared Jesus justified. He became alive in his spirit. And his spirit is down there in Hades. And all of a sudden this little lamb that everybody mocked and everybody laughed and everybody slapped and the demons tortured him and mocked him down there. All of a sudden, he became the Superman down there, <laughs> if you would. And all these spirits, Bible says like a, like a clock, like a cloak, like a cloak he just tore off him. And he, he uh, uh, yeah. it's like that movie of Superman all of a sudden coming out of the rubbles. Jesus arose and disarmed all these principalities and powers and dominions. And then uh, he came upon him, uh, Luke tells us, and overcame him and took all, all their weapons from him, all their weaponry that they had, everything that they had against mankind, all the documents, chapter 13 or verse 13 of this chapter, uh, Colossians chapter 2, verse 15, 13 through 15, it tells us that he uh, nailed to the cross all the documents that were against us. So he did, down there, he did so much for us. Oh, I love him so much. So that, that's why Romans chapter 8 verse 1 says, Now for those who are in Christ, there is no more, no more condemnation. Why? Because he took all those documents, the documents of the past, present, future, and he nailed them on the cross, paid the penalty for him, took all the weaponry from Satan and all his cohorts. It really breaks my heart when preachers constantly talk about Satan. Oh, the devil this, the devil is after you, the devil is that, the devil is this. Uh, they glorify devil more than Jesus. They have no clue about the redemption of Jesus. And people do everything to earn victory, to earn forgiveness. I, I just spoke with a man, a Muslim man. He says, I'm doing everything, I'm praying but I don't know if I'm forgiven. I love Jesus. I believe in Jesus, but I don't know if I'm forgiven. And I told him, listen, it's not your deeds that causes you, causes God to forgive you. It's the deeds of Jesus. Because of him, you are now forgiven. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9. I tell you, it was like you took a burden off his soul. He felt like a little baby. I said, now confess him as your Lord. You know, if we could just open up the scripture for people, people would believe. But we come up with all these traditions and all this religious bondage and religious laws and regulations that we put on people, and we bind people, like Jesus said. And we don't 
we don't bring him freedom. If we understand this full redemption, oh, Lord, <laughs> what the earth would be like. And so there, down there, Jesus completed the work. And then on the third day, God said, okay, son, you've done it. It's finished. Now come up. And so the Holy Spirit went down there, grabbed his soul and his body or his spirit, brought it to his body, put it in his body. He, that same spirit that raised Christ from the dead, he made alive every cell in his body. Jesus' physical body translated, transformed. We're talking about human body to the point where he could walk through the wall. Because the Bible says, well, disciples were in closed doors. Jesus appeared before him. And so uh, his body didn't have blood any longer. He had holes, but no blood was coming out. Remember when he said to Thomas, put your hand into these holes. There were holes in his physical body, but there were no blood. Blood wasn't coming out. And so his physical body, the human physical body of Jesus, is not the glorified body he has in heaven as the son of God, talking about a human body, where he walked with the disciples for 40 days and they didn't recognize him. So there was some transformation in his physical body. And that body came on the third day and brought joy and changed the human history. To God be the glory. Now my time is up and we're going to continue studying in this very important subject. Again, I encourage you to get a hold of my books on the subject, and it will really bring light to the scripture and open your eyes to this amazing redemption that we have in Christ Jesus. Again, I appreciate all of you. I love you because he loves you. And I thank you for your support of our ministry, reaching millions of Muslims for Jesus on a daily basis. In Jesus' precious name, we will see you next time. Amen.